Hello, everybody. Welcome to the conversation of our generation, where we are solving the problems of today with the wisdom of the past. My name is Nick Jamel, the creator and host of the podcast here. And today I have a great guest for you, Frank Cunha, who is an architect who will be talking a little bit about the Pantheon and St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And we are going to be talking about how the Christ- Christendom took from or pulled from the pagan architecture that came before it and how that culture still ran through despite the fact that Rome kind of turned to this Christian kingdom it still maintained this Roman look and how Christianity continued to pull from Egyptian art and architecture and Greek art and architecture to create these beautiful and amazing buildings so that's what we're going to be talking about if you're listening right now definitely keep listening but if you do have the ability to watch it on YouTube I recommend you go back and check out when at least when he gets to the part where he starts going through his presentation I'll break that out separately, that part to have as a standalone video as well, um, just so that people can check that out, because I think it's a truly interesting presentation. I know I learned a lot, and I know anyone out there who is a layman like me, as far as this stuff goes, will really enjoy it and will really learn a lot from it. And so before I dive in, I want to remind you too that you can, like I said, subscribe if you're listening to the podcast right now, leaving a good rating and review really helps. And head over to the YouTube channel and subscribe for great video content like what I have today. Or if you're just coming across this, definitely hit that button for more, uh, the subscribe button that is, for more great content like this. And check out conversationforgeneration.com for anything and everything that I do is there or it's linked there to somewhere else. So definitely check that out. And then lastly, uh, my new book, I have finally gotten my copies in of Property Rights in the Digital Age. I'm not sure how well you can see it with my lighting. but I'm very excited for that. It's a nice little, uh, nice little book. It's not too long, not too, not too crazy, but I definitely recommend you go and pick it up on Amazon. There will be a link in the show notes for you to do that. So supporting me that way really helps. And for all of those who are a member on uh, locals, conversationforgeneration.locals.com, or on Patreon, you'll be getting if you're pledging there two dollars a month you'll get a signed copy sent your way. I just sent one out to Steven Sawyer from the Vital Masculinity podcast because he won the, he ended up winning the raffle um, that I did a couple weeks ago. So definitely check out the book. I'm pretty proud of it. I'm not gonna lie. It was definitely a lot of effort, but still feels really good to have it out there. And so thank you for supporting me and for what I, supporting what I do. And let's go ahead and hop over to the interview. And so today we have Frank Cunha, from, who is an architect, who found me on Twitter a while back, and we've been going back and forth trying to have this conversation now for a couple of weeks, and I'm excited to finally bring you on today, Frank. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's great. And so for everyone who doesn't know who you are that listens to the podcast, you want to tell them a little bit about who you are, what you, uh, what you do, and, um, and then we can kind of dive into the topic from there. Yeah, sure. So I do a lot of different things. Um... I'm a, I'm a dad foremost. Um, I'm a husband and, um, and a dad, which, you know, I'm really proud of my three boys. I have twins that are 13 and I've got my older son who's 17. And, um, you know, I've just been doing a return to traditional, like, I think the more, like I was pretty much a moderate for most of my life. And as I get older, I feel like, um, you know, instilling traditional values is really important. So, that's kind of how I found you and a bunch of other people I follow on Twitter is really just trying to bring back tradition. So when I went to architecture school, like over 20 years ago, a lot of it was not what I expected when I would go to Portugal as a kid, you know, I would go and look at castles and churches and that was the stuff I was interested in. And then when I went to school, it was all about like simple geometries and modern and not a lot of detail, no ornamentation. So as I went through the program, I just realized it wasn't exactly what I thought. Um, I did enjoy my experience as an architect. I was able to be creative, but a lot of it was like postmodern and not very traditional at all. Mm-hmm. So I'm by no means an expert on what we're going to be talking about today. I'm an enthusiast. Um, the architecture that I normally do is, you know, everyone always asks, like, what kind of an architect are you? Um, I like to say that I'm a competent architect. Architects, <laughs> architects have practice just just because we're practicing throughout our whole careers. 
Um, so what's interesting about our conversation today, it's going to be about, you know, traditional architects who are also engineers and poets and screenwriters and did a lot of different things, um, which is very valuable. I feel like with postmodernism, it kind of dissected um, all the professions and made them into like little niche experts. So when people ask me like what kind of architect I am, it's not that I get offended by it, but I kind of feel like with enough time, I can, I can become an expert on, on different things. So in my own practice, I do some consulting where I have residential clients, I have, um, you know, uh, commercial clients, public clients, and um, a majority of the work that I do is as the university architect at Montclair State University, where we do have a traditional aesthetic. It's a Spanish mission. It's a revival of Spanish mission that was initiated in the early 1900s. And there's been a renaissance on our campus bringing back that style. Um, and as a modernist architect, I really didn't fully appreciate it, but it was something that the students were craving and they really liked the Spanish mission style as a cohesive way to bring the campus together. So even though they're all in different colleges, the architecture becomes the, the, uni the unifying element of the campus, the common thread, if you will. Mm -hmm. So over the last 10 to 15 years, I've just really found myself returning more to a traditional and classical style. I still enjoy modern architecture. I'm not one of these like either or, but I definitely appreciate, you know, the history aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that there's also a distinction kind of like you mentioned between something that's modern and something that's postmodern or modernist where it just has to have this sort of brutal feel to it. Like it has to be kind of either un like totally out there and wild or totally practical and like looks like the Soviet you know like right. an abandoned Soviet building and like that's kind of the two like far ends that I think people look to when they think of modern art or modern architecture but there are new things that would be considered than modern that are built more traditionally or at least building on tradition in a new way that you can you can still innovate I mean all of these old buildings were at one point innovative as well right absolutely Absolutely. And we'll touch on that today. Okay. Um, for me, it was interesting because when I first started at Montclair State, it was kind of like, well, I know better. You know, I'm trained as an architect. Like we can do modern things and we can slice and dice and do these cool things. But the students are craving for this common element. So um, mm -hmm. because they are so specialized and they're all kind of like in their own like little worlds and their own little silos, the architecture brings this community. It creates the sense of community. It's almost like... Um, the city on a hill. It's like this idealized version of what the world can be. Mm -hmm. So to be able to contribute to that over the last 15 to 20 years, both as a consultant and now as the university architect, uh, to be able to contribute to that um, architectural thread through the campus has been really, really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that too. I know when I visited IU, when I was looking at colleges um, or Indiana University, I guess, because there might be other IUs out there that people think of. But when I visited there, they had all of these, everywhere you went, it was a very cohesive thing. I mean, there were some that were newer buildings that obviously stood out and you could tell, but when you went to the older part of the campus, there were just all red brick buildings that had kind of this same look, very, I mean, traditional look. I mean, they were built 200 years ago. So built in that style and and then there's always and the funny thing is Purdue and IU each have and Purdue's all built out of limestone but they each have one building that's built out of the others mm -hmm. material so like there's one brick building at uh Purdue and there's one limestone building at IU that was original mm -hmm. it's kind of the rivalry you know so they have that their distinct looks but there's that little bit of piece that little piece mm -hmm. that they shared I thought that was just a cool like at the time I I, I mean I took that tour like eight years ago and I still remember that little fact that they had because yeah, it's just, I think that there's something that you can appreciate about that architecture and the history that comes with it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, I think even with, you know, most architects don't want to be pigeonholed into having to design traditional buildings. Uh, so, you know, just before going live on this podcast, we, we spoke br briefly about the uh, executive order and probably being overturned. You know, again, it's like the 2% elite, you know, saying, you know, we're beyond this, we can do better than this, like, we don't have to look at traditional, but then like the 98% of the people, you know, that's what they want, they're craving these um, architectural elements that, that have been around for, you know, 
thousands of years and they mean something. So I think today's uh, little presentation that I worked on is, or, you know, prepare for our discussion, but a little bit of a presentation, mm -hmm. um, you know, speaks about that. Like people are longing for the mythology, the story, the, um, like, I think that's why Jordan Peterson is so popular. You know, he talks about the, the, you know, the mythology of how we got here. We all have like a common memory. And I think where we went wrong is when we started designing for ourselves and for ego. And a lot of this started happening with the impressionists, I think. I think that was like the beginning. Um, I think like right at, like today, we're going to talk about the Pantheon and St. Peter's. And I think after St. Peter's, then you start going beyond the Renaissance and you start going into like the Rococo and the Baroque and it starts going like really like high art and like really intricate. And they get to a point where it's like so real, they can't go any further. And then all of a sudden it becomes more about how to not make it real, but make it more of a feeling, like feelings. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden it goes from that to like Jackson Pollock and then, you know, hanging a urinal on the wall or, you know, a banana on the wall or whatever. So <laughs> I think you get to a certain point where you just can't go any further. And I think that's why people always look at Rome as like the ideal height of architecture, because it's kind of like just in a way frozen in time. <laughs> you know, around the 1500s, and that's architectural perfection for mm -hmm. most, for most. I'm sure other people would yeah. argue that, but it's like a perfect state of architecture. Yeah, I think that, and there's kind of this, there's those peaks in art, in every art. I think architecture is an art of sort as well, where you have the perfect blend of the technical, you're, you're pro technically correct. You're doing all of the right things that, you know, scientifically, mathematically, whether or not they knew it at the time makes sense. Right. And speak to that that way. But then there's also the passion and the feeling that is in there as well. I think what you talked about with sort of that, I think there was a period in the kind of, as you switch from that Renaissance to the enlightenment where all the arts became very, standardized music and all that became kind of formulaic like they knew the mathemat mathematics behind it sort of where you could create a beautiful piece but it didn't have soul and then you had this reaction from Beethoven and the romantics that came and brought back I mean that's really where I think you had a lot of musicians would I would say classical musicians would say that's kind of a high point you have like Baroque style and then you have the classical style that kind of gets a little too technical and you bring it back with all of this that kind of pushes the bounds a little bit and i think the romans did that very well like they had that balance and they knew what they were building for as well they right. their buildings they knew were they they were building to the glory of rome they were there was something that that passion was behind it as well that paired very well with the fact that they were tremendous <laughs> engineers right. i mean just I think, I think they, we have not been able to recreate their concrete it's <laughs> we right their concrete is the best concrete that's ever been made and <laughs> we can't even do it with all the modern science we have. Yeah. So they, they, they curated what was great about Greek architecture and even before Greeks, you know, whether it's the Egyptians and, and other um, civilizations, I mean, they took the best out of what was in Greece and they just kind of built on it in a way that was just extraordinary. And I think because of their power and, and the fact that they didn't just conquer and pillage and although they probably did a lot of that, what yeah. they would do is they would kind of cultivate different, they would take the best out of each culture. So as they were growing across the Mediterranean, like you said, you were from Lebanon, I'm from, my ancestry is from mm -hmm. Portugal. So you're on, you're on one side mm -hmm. and my family's on the other side, but um, you know, they were able to make this cohesive thing. So even when you go to Portugal, you go to Lebanon, you could still see a lot of this architecture that existed, like the Roman roads are still there. And um, mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, the concrete and um, just like everything that they've done, that they did in terms of architecture is just so beautiful and pure, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of ge geometry and forms and symmetry and harmony. Um, I see one person on Twitter and I guess they're trying to do some classical architecture at a non-traditional architecture school and they get picked on like all these decisions have been made already for you but i have to argue that i think the more i get into traditional architecture i feel like you have a toolbox like a kit of parts but it's up to you to figure out how to put them together so mm -hmm. when we get into the presentation a little bit more about um 
St. Peter's, you'll see that there's like different architects that worked on their solution to the problem. And then ultimately a decision was made, but there was a lot of different paths on how to handle the problem and then figuring out a solution that would make sense. Um, yep. so I'm not going to get into like the politics and the religion of like Rome and the Pope and all that kind of stuff. Like today, I really just want to focus on like the architectural aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be hard to replicate that in today's age just because we're in a different place right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it, as I was running this morning, um, it was freezing out there this morning, but as I was on my run, one of the things I thought about, you know, like the, the plazas, like the Roman plazas, uh, mm -hmm. the piazzas, uh, mm -hmm. they're almost like the modern day Twitter. Like when you go on Twitter, you're talking to all these like strangers. And back in the day, you know, like the app would be, instead of having like social, you know, instead of having like a social app, like a Facebook or a Twitter, you're actually going to the piazza to like interact mm -hmm. with people and argue with people mm -hmm. and have that dialogue. Yep. Uh, going to the baths and all that. And yeah. It's an experience. So like now you have the Twitter experience, the Facebook experience. Some people love it. Some people hate it. There's good and bad. But going out in public, there was also, you know, the good and the bad. But now there's not so much a need to recreate all this architecture just because the way we operate isn't the same way that we used mm -hmm. to, you know, 2000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. We're investing in 5G instead of a beautiful building where you can come together. Exactly. <laughs> well, great. Well, let's maybe then hop into uh, a little bit about the presentation, because I think it'd be good to talk about that then. Um, and while you pull that up for the people who are listening right now and not watching, we have some visuals that go along with this. So you can head over to the YouTube channel and check that out to actually see what the uh, architecture that we're talking about looks like. But I think it'd be good to talk about, we're going to talk about the Pantheon and some of the pagan architecture that came before, like we were talking about. And how the Christian culture then came and took that on and rolled with it and kept kept up with the forms and the traditions that they inherited and how that influenced their architecture. So are you able to share your screen there? I think I you just, should be able to. You need to pause for a second. I'm going to have to get out. Of and so now that we got Zoom letting us screen share, <laughs> um, the, for anyone who's listening and heard the pause and a little bit of a skip here, uh, let's go ahead then, Frank, if you want to dive in a little bit about uh, these two pieces of architecture. Yeah, so on the left, you've got the Pantheon. On the right, you've got St. Peter's. So we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Pantheon first, and then we'll kind of zoom in like chronologically. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that's interesting is that I think the reason why people are so fascinated with the Pantheon is just because of the amount of history that it has and the fact that it's so well preserved. Mm -hmm. And it really um, has influenced architecture like all over Europe and the world, um, you know, just the way it was organized. So what they did is they took a lot of the, um, the look and feel from like the Greeks. And in this particular um, image on the left, um, there was actually 16 massive Corinthian columns that were brought over from Egypt. So I thought that was like an interesting fact. And then on the right, uh, Michelangelo has a quote that I wanna read. Um, actually, it's not much, it's just a small quote, but it basically said that he looked at the Pantheon and he said that it was angelic and not designed by human, by human beings, that it was angelic and not by human design. So when he was able to actually work on St. Peter's, the dome, that was like one of his last projects as he was like beyond 70 years old and he worked on the dome, he actually didn't exceed the size of the dome um, in respect to the Pantheon. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor of, you know, you're not designing for your ego, you're designing for something like a higher authority, like a, high, a higher essence being integrity. So he actually limited the size of the dome. Now it's a much taller dome, so he was able to flex his muscles in terms of how the dome is raised higher, but in terms of circumference, he respected the fact that um, there was his history there behind the Pantheon and he limited the diameter. Also interesting is on my, uh, I have a blog called ilovemyarchitect.com. It's not very active right now, but I was interviewing a lot of different architects 
And I would say like nine out of 10 architects that I would interview, the Pantheon would be on their list of favorite architectural buildings. Wow. It is definitely a beautiful one. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually not the original one. This is the third one that was built. And mm -hmm. um, there's like excellent YouTube videos and there's tons of blogs and websites. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna like uh, get dates wrong and, and historical nuances wrong. There's like so much stuff out there if you really wanna like dive in and uh, you know, do a deep dive. Um, but it is, it's just like an amazing piece of architecture. It's the third time it was built because of fires and every time it was built, you know, it just had to adapt to the current circumstances. So I believe that the plaza is actually raised higher uh, than the original, just because of settlement and, and other reasons. So um, you can see there's actually like a retaining wall around it. So at some point, all of this was a lot lower. So the plaza today is higher. That's why there's no steps like you would see in a, in a Greek temple. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, so we'll start with the Pantheon and, you know, I'm not, this was not a formal presentation. I just kind of threw some pictures up here just for talking points. Um, it's in a very tight space. I think the first thing that people realize about the Pantheon is that it's a really uh, urban environment and it's like really tight quarters. Um, and it's not too far away from uh, St. Peter's. So there's definitely... Uh, tradition and there's definitely context so they're definitely like speaking speaking to one another as you were talking about before like with the concrete um, the reason why it's so strong is because of the ash so they would actually use ash from like volcanic ash in the concrete and that's what allowed it to be so strong so even though the pantheon is 142 feet in diameter um, and just to give you some perspective, the U.S. Capitol's dome is 96 feet in diameter. Oh, wow. Um, um, this is one of the few domes that's actually, if not the only one that's standing, that actually is not reinforced. So, like, if we were doing this today, there's no way we would do concrete without reinforcing it. So another interesting aspect is, although it's got the Greek element of the, um, of the colonnade, uh, they did go with like a circular form, which is a little bit different than you would normally see like in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, and I found this beautiful section online. I just wanted to share it. Um, what allows the dome to like not fall apart is the fact that it has these, these rings. So when you go to the uh, aerial, you can kind of see these like different rings. So even though it looks like a dome on the inside, it's actually built in like almost like Lego pieces. So like each ring is keeping the dome in compression so it doesn't slide apart and just kind of like, oops, doesn't, mm -hmm. do, doesn't do exactly what my PowerPoint just did. So like it doesn't slide <laughs> down. Um, and I think this is just a great image. Like these, these artists were so intense that they were actually able to fill, you know, fit a sphere inside of the dome, like, like the kind of precision that this would take. Um, to be able to do something like this, even today with lasers would be, uh, would be almost impossible. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I do like your point of how they adopted that Greek look, but then they also made it uniquely Roman. They use that kind of Roman architecture to make it their own, but they pulled from something like when you look at the front of it, it looks like a Greek temple, but then right. when you come inside, it's obviously Roman. Right. And it's also like, it's not the original Roman. So in the like 14, 1500s, as like the Renaissance is going on, like the, you're going in there, but keep in mind at this time, like they were taking stuff from different buildings. So like the popes and pre, like, as they were building cathedrals, they, they would go into these different temples and like strip the marble, strip the column top. So when you go inside, when you go inside the Pantheon, a lot of that stuff is not the original pagan temple it was already beautified you know um, it was already being converted to a church i think it was like in the third in the 300s um so by the time you know michelangelo's looking at this it's already you know almost like a thousand over a thousand years later from when this was converted to a church so there's a lot of different um christian elements in here that weren't original as part of the temple mm -hmm. Um, the other interesting fact is the fact that it's just open air. I don't know if you knew that, but it's actually the, um, the oculus there is like actually open to the elements. So when it rains and snows inside, the floor actually has floor drains and there's like, you know, different tapered floor, um, 
floor angles that allow the water to drain out. Hmm. That's awesome. And it's just very simple too. Like I think once you get to like the height of the Renaissance, you start getting all these like beautiful paintings. And when you get to the Baroque, you've got all these like flowing, um, flowing elements, whether it's cloth or, um, you know, movement of, uh, of form. Whereas here, it's just like this pure pagan thing where it's just like the geometry. <laughs> yeah. And it's still, yeah, it's still very beautiful. It's just this kind of, it's just simple and elegant at the same time. Yeah. So, I mean, what I love about it is just the fact that, you know, being pagan and being, um, you know, engineering, scientific, like following, um, you could, uh, the architecture becomes like a clock or a calendar. Calendar is probably a better word than clock, although it, it, it would serve the purpose of both. Uh, you know, at high noon, you'd get the light coming directly down. And then depending on the time of the year, you're going to get different light angles. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And I believe I could be wrong because I'm going back like 20 something years to my history class or almost 30 years to my history class in the architecture school. But I'm pretty sure that the light, I think, I think during not the equinox, but the uh, solstice, I believe that you actually get the light coming in from the front doors. I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that um, there's like some just amazing engineering in terms of the way the light uh, transforms the space. So there's a play between the actual materiality of the architecture, but also nature, godliness, whether it's multiple gods or one God, like nature and God and something higher than yourself that's on this rhythm and the architecture becomes a way to record it. So it's almost like a camera, if you will, like mm -hmm. literally, um, you know, playing with light. That's awesome. That's so incredible. Yeah. So then I think it was around, um, I'm sorry, I didn't take really good notes, but I think it was like the early 300s that it became a, um, a Catholic church. And someone was arguing with me. I took something from Wikipedia, someone, someone on Twitter, was arguing with me there's always someone arguing with you yeah and i don't claim to know everything i mean it was just like something i clipped but um i put down something like now it's used as a catholic church and uh or a christian church and 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 someone was like it's not being you know that's a pagan temple and it's like well this is what it's being used for now so this was kind of like my transition from you know pagan to christianity but before we get to rome I wanted to take a little bit of a detour and go to Florence because I love Florence. I love Leonardo. I love like everything that's, you know, that happened in Florence. It's just so beautiful. So I think getting, I think to understand Rome, I think you have to understand Florence. I'm not going to get into the Medici. I'm not going to get into Leonardo, but I just wanted to touch on Brunelleschi because um, I don't know if you know, but um Santa Maria de Fiore, for a while, I had no dome. It was like a problem that they were having and they weren't able to solve the problem of how do you build a dome? <laughs> and they didn't want to just build a regular roof. So it was kind of just like left undone for a long time. And then there was a competition. I think it was like in the 1300s. No one was able to solve it. I think even Leonardo um, da Vinci had an option on, on how to solve it. Uh, Bruno Leschi, if I remember correctly, was a watchmaker and a craftsman. Um, so, you know, this was the state that it was in, and then he was able to work on these like very fine tuned models and buttresses and trying to figure out how to solve the problem. And they solved it by creating two different shells. Like there's an outer shell and an inner shell, and you can actually go there today and you can actually walk in between like the, uh, anti-space, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, so before you get to Rome, I think it's really important to understand Florence and this dome, because I think... There's a lot of other stuff that happened that was really important, but just as a quick, like little, you know, conversation, like a quick little um, Cliff's, Note, uh, Cliff's Notes version of architecture. I think you really need this project in between before you get to Rome. Mm -hmm. Because all, all of these decisions that are being made are just like trying to solve problems. And even like today, you know, when a client calls me up and they have an issue, it's just coming up with a creative way to solve the problem. So this was like the big problem of the day is how do you put a roof on this beautiful church? And Bruno Lusky is able to do that. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a little bit of context, this is where the uh, Pan Pantheon is. <clears throat> and then across the river, you have um, Nero Circus. Mm. 
So what's cool is that, um, you know, before this whole development happened of the brand new St. Peter's, there's the old St. Peter's. I don't know if you know about old St. Peter's. I do not know much. Oh, you don't know. So, yeah, so there was an old St. Peter's there, believe it or not. So I kind of threw this up there just as like a quick, um, I don't want to use the word lesson, but just, you know, as we're having a discussion, just to have like a visual. So there was an old building there. And I was reading some things just this week about how like this, this, like shingles were sliding off and uh, there was like rats in the rafters and like this place like really needed like a major overhaul. Uh -huh. uh, so it was just a basic, you know, simple structure. A lot of the um, basilicas actually took from the pagans in terms of like their format. And then what they would do is they would basically turn them into crosses. So because this is like one of the earliest ones, I don't even think this is a cross. Let me see. I actually have a plan here. Um, I think I messed up my slide. I think this one was supposed to be first. Um, yeah, so, you know, this was the original plan of the church. So it wasn't really much of a cross. So this is like right yeah. before, you know, it becomes a cross. Um, I don't know. Can you see my pointer? Yep. So yep. right around here is this is what they're calling the probable place of execution, chapel of crucifixion. So this is where they're thinking that St. Peter was actually... Um, executed upside down he didn't want to be executed uh -huh. the way jesus was so he was crucified upside down so this is the church that we were just looking at here which was a you know a lovely church but it was just like in a state of disrepair you can imagine this is um you know 13 14 1500 years um it's time for a facelift one of the biggest issues is that in order to build like this big new basilica that would house like over 600 people um, one of the big things was trying to figure out um, how to deal with the obelisk. So I wanted to throw this on here because it's like there's a whole interesting story. You could do a deep dive into this alone. But um, this obelisk that came from Egypt was in the um, in the Circus of Nero. And in order to build in order to build a basilica, they had to move it. So they finally like figured out a way to do it and disassemble it. And then it gets reassembled later on in um Bernini's new Vatican Plaza. Huh. Interesting. I think it's pretty interesting. I That's kinda, crazy. I kind of geek out on this stuff. So this is like showing you the original. And then Bramante was an architect that was one of the rivals of Michelangelo. I don't know if you remember, but Bramante's the one that was like, the Pope had all his like favorite um, artists. Uh, I know he liked Raphael for what he did. He liked Michelangelo. For some reason, he had him do a lot of painting versus sculpture, which Michelangelo really didn't like that. Um, and then Bramante was his favorite architect. So Michelangelo builds on Bramante's plan and kind of creates more nooks. Things are starting to get a little bit like less flowery and delicate and becoming like more massive. Like Michelangelo likes to have like, he thinks like a sculptor. So he's basically looking at this as more of a carving, whereas Bramante is looking at more of like this airy, airy structure, air e structure, mm -hmm. or light structure. And then what happens is we get Moderna who comes in and like actually adds this whole portico. So there's like all these debates about whether it should be a cross or not a cross. And so in this version, the Moderna version, they actually wind up adding a portico. So some architects argue that that takes away from the dome. Mm. So I, I'll show you a... Um, I'll show you how, what that, what that means in a second. But this is basically what it looks like today. So you have the Sistine Chapel, you got the obelisk, you got Bernini's um, arms, if you will, the open arms, the universal church opening its arms to everyone. Um, and you've got this like beautiful, massive new basilica. I couldn't help but throw in here like a little image of uh, my favorite artist, Michelangelo. I mean, even though he did it, begrudgingly he did like this amazing job um you know whether it was a sculpture when he was young or his paintings like you know there's just tons of art <laughs> um in the basilica itself bernini doing the um you know the plaza one interesting thing is they kind of uh, move from the sphere to the oval now so what's interesting about that is we're no longer pure. So you're kind of getting to a point now where you're moving from the purity of form, like the square, the rectangle, 
the mm-hmm. circle and now Bernini is more, he's kind of, when I learned about postmodernism in architecture school, I learned a lot about um, the fold and the folds of Bernini. And I remember the first time I saw Bernini, um, like a tear came to my eye. I mean, it was just so beautiful the way, um, you know, you had the Egyptians that would build a statue of a man or a woman, but typically a man. And then you would have the Greeks that would build on it and make it a little bit more realistic and idealized where now they start getting, you know, muscular chest and they start mm-hmm. getting, you know, thinner waist and musk, you know, um, you know, the ideal form. And then you get mm-hmm. to the part where you get to like the Renaissance, where it becomes like the David, where you start seeing the veins and you start seeing like, you know, the reality of um, the human form. And then you get to like Bernini, where it's like the Rococo and you start getting the folds. It's no longer about the person because now like they're already able to like mimic humanity. So now it's like cloth and clothes and you start getting a little bit of that in Michelangelo's Pieta where you do get Mary's uh, flowing, uh, um, you know, her dress. But then with Bernini, like this is the beginning of where it's no longer Renaissance and you start going into, um, you know, you start going into the Baroque and then the Rococo where things start getting like really elaborate just because like there's no other place, like there's nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the plan that I was talking about, you've got the Michelangelo plan, which builds on the Bramante plan. And then you get the Moderno um, portico. And what happens is you kind of get a little taste of it from this picture. You no longer, like Michelangelo, I think was closer to the Pantheon out of respect where you do get the dome um, being like this really important element. And when you put that portico it makes the basilica bigger and it kind of gives you, you know, the wow factor, but it also takes away from the dome. So if you're standing, you know, directly in front of the basilica, you're not going to see the dome Mm -hmm. in order to get the shot. You have to go like way back. Mm -hmm. Um, And then this little image here just kind of shows you, this is also a Bernini. So Bernini inside, Bernini outside. And you could see by Michael, Michelangelo creating these like deeper niches, you, you start creating these like little, side chapels. So when you go to churches, especially pogrom sites, I love Santiago de Compostela, which is like another discussion for another day. When you go there, like you can have the main mass going on, but then you could have like these like little side chapels where you can be doing prayers, you could be doing pilgrimages to your favorite saint. So creating these like little niches just creates like other opportunities for respect and prayers and. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. I, and they carry that throughout Christendom too. I, I've been to England and Ireland and uh, Spain and all those, uh, not all, but all, almost all of those churches, the older ones have those little places off to the side where you can go in and yeah, lots of little areas and it's always dedicated to a saint. Or, yeah. So here you could see the obelisk you know, being moved from where, where it was over here and now being, you know, erected in the center. And, you know, I think this is like a powerful symbol too, because as the Egyptians being the first ones to have it, and then the pagan Romans to have it, and then the church, I think there's like a, uh, you know, there's a logical sequence to owning the power. So you can get into like the whole like systematic, systematic, systematic racism and um, (laughs) appropriations and, (laughs) <laughs> colonializations and all that kind of stuff but just from a purely architectural standpoint it just shows like the evolution of like the egyptians the greeks the romans and then the catholic church for good or bad like all these years of being in control of the power the money the architecture and then you get these like beautiful buildings mm-hmm. um, it's sort well, of a passing of the torch of empire <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then um This is just a comparison of different domes. So you can kind of see the Hagia Sophia, which is like a beautiful project as well. St. Peter's Basilica, even though it's taller, they respect the Pantheon. So even though Michelangelo was easily able to do what they did in Florence, because Florence, Bruno was 45 meters, uh, the Pantheon is 43. So if the Pantheon came first and then Florence, you know, St. Peter's could have definitely have been bigger if Michelangelo chose to. So he chose the height, but respected the diameter. So this was just a little graphic just to show that. And this kind of gives you a a perspective of of, uh, Michelangelo's dome. 
And then I thought this was kind of cool. What I did is I just superimposed the, um, the Pantheon with the uh, St. Peter's Dome just to kind of give you a, a little comparison there. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is that now instead of having one Oculus, you get these multiple uh, mm -hmm. array of light coming in from the, um, you know, the new dome. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's beautiful. And we could talk about this too. This is actually built by um, this like little shrine area it was built by uh, Brunelleschi. And it actually is what houses um, St. Peter's remains below. Mm -hmm. so I didn't even want to get into that, <laughs> into that yeah. far deep. Um, there's also an interesting place here. I was trying to figure out a way to do Constantine to Charlemagne. And Const <laughs> you, know, you know, Constantine was the one where his mom was Christian and he mm -hmm. wasn't. And um, he had the vision. And in battle, you know, he had, he had his uh, army paint the... Um, paint the, the Christian cross on the shields and they won that battle. And then there was the conversion of the Roman pagans to Christianity. And keep in mind the Romans, there was no God they didn't like. I mean, they were kind of hedging their bets with God. So Christianity wasn't like that far of a stretch. It wasn't that they were against the God of Moses. It wasn't that they were against Jesus. It was just, we're the God of, of uh, Christians, it was just that, um, you know, they had their state gods, but they would never turn down a God, you know, they didn't want to piss off any God, they wanted to make sure that they hedged their bets. So it was an yep. easy, you know, it was an easy way to, to convert people, especially since um, Christianity at that time, as it was growing, the Catholics would actually take what was already a pagan belief, like in the northern areas, whether it's like in England or in Germany or further north, a lot of the uh, cultures that would have like um, like nymphs and uh, mm -hmm. believe in like goddesses of the lakes, like that that would become like Mary of you know Mary of the lake. Or mm -hmm. what they would do is they would they would kind of take oh you know you like you like the forest, let's connect that with like the wood of Jesus' cross. So they would take like different cultures, different gods, and because they were the universal church, they would kind of figure out a way to like intermingle it, even so much when they went to like South, South America and, and India, and as they were colonizing, they were able to like take the local gods and kind of put the Catholic and Christian spin on it. Mm -hmm. And that was what allowed, you know, Christianity to grow for so many years. Mm -hmm. and, and they still, you know, there's also the story of some saint, I don't remember who it is, but Thor's tree, they were afraid to cut it down up in like Norway and he just walked out with an ax and just chopped the thing down mm -hmm. and he's like see nothing happened <laughs> like there was also that sense of your pagan gods are you know nothing compared to right. this god like so it's interesting but I do see that uh there, there's this Christian sense of taking that culture and baptizing it and bringing it into that universal church and saying hey here's the true way about doing like right. here's the truth about it you have you're getting there, but here's the full truth. And how do we incorporate that then right. into this body of Christ? And I think that's kind of what the state is doing now. We're kind of going full circle and kind of getting a little bit into politics and culture. I think that's what's happening is like you had the Catholic church and then you had the reformations. And in all fairness, the Catholic church was reforming itself, not quickly enough, but then even after the Protestant reformation, there, was, there has been Catholic reforms for good or bad mm -hmm. over the years. Uh, ending with Vatican II, I mean, that was the, the last big one. And I think we're going through one right now with um, mm -hmm. contraceptives and abortions. And, you know, the Catholic Church of today isn't exactly the way it was, you know, even 50 or 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I think but I think the state has kind of taken on what Christianity was doing for millennia. Now the state is trying to do. Um, but I think what's going to be different is that there was tolerance as much as, you know, history can be rewritten and say that, you know, Christians weren't tolerant, like with the, what was it, the uh, witchcraft trials and all those kind of things. At the end of the day, I mean, it was still a, um, a tolerant, you know, based on contextually speaking, they were very tolerant yeah. and allowing for other Allowing is probably not a good word to say, but um, folding in different aspects of different cultures and taking what was the best out of all of them 
in, mm -hmm. um, and incorporating it into the universal church. Mm -hmm. For sure. So that was like the end of my visualizations. I mean, we could go back to any one of these. I kind of just wanted to, um, I know we're limited on time. I just kind of wanted to give you an overview of, you know, just how you get from the Pantheon to St. Peter's as an example of architectural evolution. Mm -hmm. No, I think it was a wonderful presentation. And for anyone who's listening, uh, if some of those things didn't make sense, definitely head over to YouTube and watch <laughs> this because I know we talked about it and I, I'm sure you could follow, um, but I do think it really enriches the experience to actually see these pictures as we're talking through it because it's incredible. I, I mean, when you look at, I think it's interesting to see, I mean, I'm also very Irish. And so looking at some of those uh, overviews of the Basilica, mm -hmm. um, you could kind of see that Celtic cross almost in it. Right. And that form instead of, you know, just a plain cross, it does have that full form to it. And it's interesting to see uh, how so much of Christianity shares that wherever you go, you can kind of find some of those commonalities and it really does tie it together. Yeah. I mean, even the orientations of how, you know, of how these churches and basilicas are oriented so that, um, you know, the way they, they're oriented on an East West axis, you know, that alone, Mm -hmm. um, it's really significant. So now, like, you know, you could build a local church in the neighborhood and it's just kind of plopped in the way yeah. it fits. But back then, it, there was a lot of consideration of where the sun rose and where the sun sat and how the uh, cathedrals mm -hmm. and churches and basilicas were placed on the site mm -hmm. really played a part. Yeah, now you have me trying to figure out which way my church <laughs> faces. I guess it faces west, the front door would. Yeah. And that's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty typical. Yeah. Nah, that, yeah. It, I just think it's so beautiful. And I, I love what I love about this Christian architecture and what happened over Christendom is that you can see how they incorporated that. I mean, when you look at St. Peter's, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't look all that different. I mean, it does look diff very different from the Pantheon, but mm -hmm. in a sense, you can see how they build on the culture that they had before they build on Roman culture and Greek culture. And for all the people who I think like to talk about medieval times and the dark ages, there's a tremendous amount of beauty and development and enriching that those pagan cultures that actually happened. Then uh, it's just a bunch of enlightenment thinkers who thought they were better than those times. <laughs> kind of rewriting history as they talk about it but yeah i thank you for this presentation i think it was really interesting i learned a lot i i think i mean for me what i find fascinating is when you use what was there like the not so much the materials like from a quarry but when you take an actual column and you reuse that column mm -hmm. uh, so when you get into like a lot of these like mosques so mosque slash cathedral of cordoba where it was you know, a pagan temple that got converted into a Christian church that then got converted into a mosque. And then during, you know, um, and then it gets converted back to a cathedral. I mean, like when you see the architecture and, and, and the play of uh, different forms, um, you know, the Roman arch, the, the, the Gothic arch, then you've got the um, like, the more Muslim looking arch or Islamic arch. Mm -hmm. uh, as an architect, I just appreciate like the different layers of history that are built upon each other. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I, I kind of try to be optimistic about even the state that we're in today. I think like we're just like one more layer of history and that there's still hope out there. I yep. think that there's the glimmer of hope and there's potential for um, I don't think you're ever going to recreate like a St. Peter's because I don't think there's a need to re recreate a St. No. Peter's. Um, unfortunately, I think like, it's just, we're not there right now and the state doesn't mandate that and corporations aren't going to be building like this kind of beautiful thing. So a lot of times I'll see like on my Twitter feed, like architects, what's keeping you from building this way? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> You know, it's, well, it's the capital. Well, my client one. Yeah, it's the client. It's, you know, these are popes with like 
I don't want to say unlimited budget, but they've got resources, you know, whereas today, you know, you might have a million bucks to build something. You're not going to build this for a million bucks, you know? So, um, you know, architecture is a very expensive art, art form to, you know, to, to, uh, to implement and execute. So you can have these grand ideas, but unless there's money to actually um, fabricate it, it's not going to happen. So that's, that, that's, what's, interesting about this period of time is that the capital was there and the human artistry was there and they were doing it for the right reasons. At least they believe they were doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. Whereas today, I just don't see why you would do, you know, why you would be doing this. So that's, that's my true. humble answer to that question is architects, why don't you build this way? It's, I don't think we can, and there's no one that wants us to, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the people then really wanted it as well. That's the other thing that it, people like to say, oh, the Catholic church has all this money and they're building all this instead of feeding the poor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it takes me back to everyone who says that it reminds me, it's like, uh, that was the argument that Judas made when uh, <laughs> Mary washed his or perfumed his feet with her hair, right? Or the woman mm -hmm. did. I forget if it was Mary Magdalene or just the woman, but you know, that idea that he's like, no, you have to, I am supposed to be ornamented i you know i am god incarnate you, mm -hmm. there is a respect that's due to me and i think that the common people have that respect that they're like i want to have that i want to be a part of building that glorious uh temple to god and the other thing is this is a public domain thing too so anyone can come in and appreciate this art the catholic church was able to be the museum before you had a museum and it was free for anyone to come and see this beauty you didn't have to be rich right. to have a beautiful place to go and look at this I mean tremendous I mean just looking at this picture here <laughs> you know that wasn't actually everywhere else in history besides Christendom that was reserved for the rich for the king and for his court that wasn't that for the common man mm -hmm. no that is a great way to look at it yeah. And, and so, I mean, I, I think, I, you know, my brother has his disagreements about like, you know, he kind of says that every now and then where it's like, you know, why do we build all these things? And I'm like, because it's, there is something about beauty in my interview with stained glass cell he talked about that, you know, that's what led to his conversion. In yeah, a people, large way. people are longing for this right now. And I think that's why there's a return to traditionalism is because people are longing for like, how can you compare this to a square box? You know what I'm saying? Like a square white box. Like, how can you even and say that the white box is better? I mean, you would have to psychologically and philosophically rationalize it. But objectively, you can't argue that this is a more perfect um, construction than a blank box. Like, you can't, you can argue it with words, but you can't argue it with rationality. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, and I agree. And I think that's the problem that we're having right now is that you can create beautiful modern things and there's some pretty cool modern pieces of architecture out there. But to just say that this is worthless is, is just wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. And I, I, yeah, it's I, when you look at it, I, I think that people like to rationalize around it, but there's one thing about like truth, you have to work towards it. Goodness, you have to, you know, work towards that. But beauty, I think you can just sit and appreciate it. And you can't argue against mm -hmm. beauty when you see it. When you like, when you look at this, when you hear a beautiful piece of music, you just know that there's something calling you in that. And I think that's why it's so powerful for people. Yeah. And a lot of these craftsmen that were actually carving like the birds that you know, no one would see, people would say, like, why are you spending all this time and effort? Like, no one's ever going to see that bird. And they would say, well, God's going to see it. Like, you're doing it for not yourself. You're doing it for mm -hmm. a higher reason, like a higher calling. And I think that's what makes it so powerful. So I use this as my inspiration. I know in my lifetime, I'll probably ne not be able to create something of this magnitude, but at least I can long for it and I can contribute in my own way, even if it's just symmetry, harmony, uh, light, uh, materiality, detail, um, you know, all the things that make this space beautiful. Um, I mean, you could spend a week in here and not know every detail. I mean, there's just so much to take in from this beauty that, um, 
you know, it's just intense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to bring this intensity to the every day, I think would be very powerful mm -hmm. and would add I value and meaning to your life. You know, like right now, meaning is like how many notifications that I get. Like, no, that's not meaningful. That's meaningless. <laughs> yeah. Like we're looking for meaning in our life. You know, we're looking for beauty. We're looking for a meaning. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. For sure. And, and to kind of wrap up here then, Frank, where are some places that people can find you, find out more about what you're up to? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of everywhere. Sometimes I want to quit and just like hide out and become a hermit. But, um, you know, you can find me. I have a website. Um, I'm on Facebook. Not much, but I'm there. <laughs> and then uh, Twitter, I'm uh, Frank Cunha with the Roman numeral three. And then on Instagram, which you could just see pictures of my puppy and my, uh, and my adventures as a triathlete, I'm Architect Ninja. So that's, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Well, thanks for this presentation. This is, just, I mean, I know I learned a lot. Hopefully everyone out there learned a lot. And like I said, if you're listening, definitely go over to YouTube and watch because seeing it with the visuals really makes a big difference. Yeah. So thanks for coming on today, Frank. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. For sure. For sure. It was awesome. Thank you. Like I said, a pretty amazing interview, wasn't it? It's just mind blowing. Some of the stuff he was able to share and some of the facts and history about those buildings is just incredible and it's really cool to see how the architecture plays with the culture around it and with the you know changing even climate and uh you know with the building settling and having to adjust to that just how time makes you have to adjust the architecture in a huge way and so that's really cool to just hear all that and to learn so much more about these buildings that you see all the time but I, for me personally, didn't know much about. So definitely I'm grateful to Frank for coming on and talking about that. And I'm thankful that you're listening to this right now. And so definitely if you're interested, if you've gone all the way through this and you want more great content, subscribe on YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can just go to anchor.fm slash conversation or slash con of our gin rather. And you can go there and anywhere that podcasts are found, you can find it there and it'll link right to my podcast and leave a good rating and review too. That stuff helps and share this on social. All of those things are helpful. And like I said, if you go and you want to learn more about property rights in the digital age, how we are finding a way to move forward and preserve, maintain, and even expand our right to own property, despite the fact that it's harder to understand what that property may be in a digital age when it's not a physical good it's not something you can touch feel taste right there's it's something that exists online in the cloud whatever that may be how do we continue to preserve those property rights and build the institutions to do that that's what this book talks about and so definitely check it out and give it a read on buy it on amazon links are in the show notes or you can just search it and find it on amazon and thank you for listening to this episode today of the conversation of our generation. My name is Nick. And thank you for listening to this episode of the conversation of our generation today. Let's get the dialogue going. I'll talk to you next time.